Let us pray. Lord, guide us to see that our preparation for you is based on our hope that you are our salvation. Remind us to be hopeful even in the midst of extreme adversity. Amen. So how many of you had a tough couple of years? Cain, really? It was good? Uh, that's good. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> How many of you were all hoping that this whole COVID thing was going to be over and then the Omicron variant came up and you're like, why? That's me. How many of you are feeling so burnt out that you just want the pandemic to be over already? Yep, me too, yep. And how many are you finding it hard to find a silver lining in all of this stuff? A little bit, a little bit. If you answered yes to any of these things, then you're probably on the same boat as me in this boat we call dread. But I don't know about you, but it just feels like we were always having to be on edge, always tiptoeing around things, always not being able to be comfortable where we are at. Our bodies are seemingly constantly constantly on high alert everywhere we go. What used to not exhaust us, you know, going to giant, can now exhaust us. The economy seems to be tanking. Inflation is rising out of control. Climate change is causing severe storms and natural disasters. And we're devastating populations of people through these changes. And not only that, people seem to be growing even more extreme in their beliefs about all kinds of things. Everybody, the world, seems to be on edge. With each passing day, the optimism about the world getting better seems to be fading farther and farther away. Our ability to work together seems to be fading each passing day as we hunker down into survival mode and get further into the us versus them mindset. I'm not saying here at Renewed in Grace. I'm just saying in the world. There's a lot of us versus them in the world. A lot of it. The world seems to be losing its hope. And I hope is what Sunday is all about, this Sunday. I know it's about preparation, but the reason we are preparing is because of the hope that we have. See, the biblical hope and secular hope are two different things. (laughs) In the world, we hear people having hope because of something they see in the moment. That thing, that silver lining that I talked about, that that's what gives us hope in the secular realm. Our hope grows when there is something in front of us to help us realize that there is a possibility to get what out of whatever it is that we're in. That's the hope of the world. But that is not the hope of the Bible. Biblical hope is realizing that the current situation is horrific, that there may be no silver lining, that nothing good has come about the situation, and that there is nothing in front of us giving a sense of hope. But we hope anyway. That's biblical hope. I'll say it again. (laughs) Biblical hope is realizing that the current situation is absolutely horrific, that there may be no silver lining, no glimmer of light in the darkness, that nothing good has come about the situation and that there is absolutely nothing in front of us that we can see giving us a sense of hope. But we hope anyway. That's biblical hope. Why? Because of what happened in the past, because of Jesus, because of Moses, because of Noah. Biblical hope is all about this idea that God has not given up on the world, no matter how horrible we perceive the world to be. That there is a way to fix the problems of this world, even if we don't see them yet. To me, this is a better understanding than the secular understanding of hope, because it allows a situation to just be bad. 
Sometimes there is no silver lining. Sometimes the world is just horrible. And this works because biblical hope isn't based on our own personal circumstances. Our hope isn't determined by what life provides for us. It is determined by what God has already done for us. And I hope you see the power and strength in that. When we come to the table already with hope in our hearts, it doesn't matter what happens in our life. We can still have hope, not find it, but have it. Because it's not the circumstances that we encounter that define our optimism or our hope. It's what's already in our hearts. What this means is that we are still ourselves, we are still loved children of God, no matter what life puts in front of us. Our circumstances do not define our identity. The world will try to break us down and there will be scars and there will be pains that will endure. But those experiences will not define us. They can shape us, surely, but they don't define who we are. We don't need a silver lining because we don't need to find hope. We already have it, as I said. There's this trend going around where people are constantly optimistic. Drives me crazy. If I hear, just stay positive one more time. Ah. And this is called toxic positivity. And it is toxic. Not because it's bad to be positive, not saying that, but that it's asking us to ignore aspects of our life that are bad. When we are overly optimistic or overly positive, we leave no room for the negative or the sorrow. And that's a disservice to the feelings that we're feeling. When we are overly optimistic, we're ignoring a part of ourselves. We are constantly trying to live as if bad things don't happen. We're not living in reality. But that is such a, it is such a disastrous place to be in, being overly positive, in my opinion. Because what tends to happen more often than not is that when we just push our negative feelings down and don't feel them, they all come out with an explosion of anger or depression. And that's not good for any. And what biblical hope is trying to teach us is that we can acknowledge that life just sucks sometimes, right? But in the midst of the terribleness, we can still be hopeful for a better future. It's this both and mentality that Lutherans love, and I love it. Not because the current moment has a positive, but that the future has a positive because the past had a positive. I know this is getting very convoluted. But the point is that preparing for Christ's birth means recognizing that the world is in need of saving and in need of changing. That there isn't a silver lining in everything and that the beaten, bloody, dead body of our Savior is a reminder of the horrifics of this world. But the resurrection is the hope and the goal of this world. But the two images do not detract from one another. And I think that's so important for us to constantly have in our minds. They are both fully present and they have their own moments. We should never say, well, yeah, Jesus was beaten and murdered and all, but at least he rose from the dead. That at least statement detracts from the seriousness of the event. It washes over the horrifics of crucifixion. Just like when we say, well, at least I still have my health. At least I have a job. At least, at least, at least. When we say at least, we may think it's an expression of gratitude, but really it's an invalidation for the pains or the trials that we're currently going through. I'll say that one again. When we say at least, we may think it's an expression of gratitude, 
but it's really an invalidation of the pains or the trials that we are currently going through. It's hard for us to just sit in the, in, in the uncomfortable. It is. We want to immediately turn away from anything that is painful, hurtful, intimidating. But hope in Christ gives us the ability to just sit in it. To not necessarily be okay with it, I'm not saying that, but to sit in it. There is a reason why we didn't hear Jesus say, well, at least I'll be risen after this. No. Nope. Didn't do that. Jesus cried. Jesus wept. Jesus asked God, take this away from me. Jesus was afraid of dying, afraid of the, of the pain of crucifixion. Jesus didn't try to mask his horrific situation with positive thoughts. So neither should we. So here's your unasked for permission to feel your negative emotions. Let them out. Let God hear them. Let a trusted friend or a family member hear them. You can either call me or set up a meeting and I'll listen. Because holding it in, hoping it will go away, will never work. Because our hope comes with a crucified Savior and a resurrection. And we should never forget either part. The good does not cancel out the bad, just like the bad doesn't cancel out the good. They live together in the same playing field. So prepare for the Lord by letting go. Feeling what you feel, experiencing what you experience, giving everything to God, the good and the bad. And let no one diminish your negative or painful emotions. They are just as valid, just as real as your positive and good feeling ones. Amen.